obviously. Um, but the reason for it is um, in terms of workday roles, right? This is the probably the first big uh, role that someone could get into after learning workday. Um, supporting compensation is, is a need that companies need on an annual basis. And then the role that someone will grow into after they begin joining either in a support role or a, on the business side and understanding all of the technicalities of workday structure for compensation um, is the compensation consultant. Compensation consultant, they help the company manage their annual compensation process and also if they want to restructure their compensation, say that they never implemented salary ranges and they want now they want to implement them so they could guide their hiring process or they could guide their managers on you know what the budget is for their open positions they want to have those values or they want to add um, finance in the approval flow but finance wants to see what is the salary or what is the expected salary of the position that they're opening and so now they want to hire now they want to add the compensation page into the uh, position or into the job requisition and they need advice on how to load uh, the grades or the grade ranges and, and to set them up. So, you know, because this is the, the first role and is, um, is based on configurations and functionality, so this is the role of the compensation consultant. Uh, sometimes people go into HR and then once they get experience within the human resources on the compensation side, then they move to the workday compensation consultant role. So not only there's a lot of material in the compensation, but it's also the, the first big role that we come across. And uh, so that's why I'm putting a lot of uh, time into this. And then I'll also, um, I'm gonna cover some more of it today as well. Okay, and then to recreate what we have done so far, uh, like I said, Workday is a system of organizing HR data. So we have, you know, we have created organizations, and then underneath that organization, you have created a job profile, and, and then you created a position. But then when you hire someone, you need to pay that person. So that's where compensation comes in. And Today we're gonna. I want to show you how you guys do the. Um, well, I'll pull up a job profile again, and make sure that uh, I walk guys through creating a grade. It's, it's used during the hiring process. It's also used during transfers and also to collect compensation data and analytics. So one quick way to navigate to the grade is just type grade. I'm getting a chat. So. Uh, someone asked, does the payroll consultant differ from the compensation consultant? Um, very much so. They're, they're very different because payroll consultant would help you implement the payroll side uh, of Workday. So they will implement Workday payroll. And the only role that they would have on, you know, for HR would be they want to make sure that we have a payroll calendar set up and we have a salary plan set up or you know all the plans that they well they wouldn't even know what all the plans are on the hr side um but yeah payroll workday payroll consultant is for implementing workday payroll or the workday hr to payroll system integration all right um I'm going to pull up a grade. So here we have a grade. This format, you know, they have just labeled it as management grade, and it's called management compensation grade. It doesn't tell you, you know, it does tell you that this is management. It doesn't tell us what level of management. 
you know, is it like management level one, management level two? That would be, you know, I assume if in the real world, it, it might have some kind of indication of that, like M1, M2, M3, and then you have the executive grades. Um, and, and then we have the compensation ranges, which I did go through before. Uh, well, this is just the compensation, compensation basis pay range, like basically the overall pay range. But remember we said grade profiles help you localize what the pay range is. So this pay range is gonna be for the headquarters. You know, if the headquarters happens to be in the US, it's, it's in USD, but in order to localize it, uh, we have it here as well. So I know I, I demoed it for you, but I didn't ensure you guys how to create one. So let me just create it, create. And this is probably, I mean, it really depends on the company, but more than likely they would be using grade profiles so that you could use the same grade um, and same job profile in multiple locations. So we have to give it a name. Management. Base pay is always going to be total base pay because this is going to define the uh, range for the base pay. Like base pay means your compensation without any additional elements, you know, without any allowance or without any um, bonus or any other kind of payments. With, with this basic setup right here, next up is the composition pay range for the default area. So here we have a choice of saying calculate segments or we enter them in. So if you hit calculate, then you only have to enter the minimum and the maximum, or you could just enter the minimum and the um, segment one, segment two, segment three. Now these are compensation terminology. You could Google uh, pay ranges, you know, within the HR function. So this is not like really workday uh, categories, but it basically means that when you have a pay range, you have the minimum, you know, that's recommended and the maximum, and then the workday calculates the midpoint. And the purpose of that is to so you could create eligibility rules around it and provide guidance of what the uh, expected salary is or what's the expected budget required for that job. You know, that, that 300 fine is probably not midpoint, but I'm not going to calculate it. So this is the default salary range in USD. And then to localize it, we're gonna take the same name, but we're gonna put the country initials in front of it. You have to tell me the eligibility rule is required. At the top, it was not required, but because over here we have to tell, um, for which country or which location we're making this uh, great profile. So here is required. Mm 
Yeah. So there is a master for grades and grade profiles, and also to view it because obviously, you know, here I only created one grade profile. Uh huh. Um, but you know, typically you might have like five or six countries at a minimum, so it's kind of hard to view it. So you will typically view this in a report format. And then also if you're creating a lot of them, you would load it via an EIB integration. And I will show you guys that uh, when we get to the EIBs. So creating a grid and grid profile is simple as that. And at the time of implementation or at the time when they want to restructure it, the composition consultant will help them with it. And then you could give the training to the composition analyst who sits on the HR team uh, and they could manage any changes to, to these. Yeah. Um, so it's used in many places. Uh, that's why it's important to learn how to create that. Okay, so next topic. Um, there is a grade range report. Um, there might one already exist, or I could create one. Um, so let me just type grade and just search in the system what we have. There wasn't one, I mean, there might be one, but I don't want to take the time to search for it, but I started creating my own. Um, and it's not, this report is not fully finished yet, uh, but I do have the field compensation grade. And we see there's 234 items. So basically I was pulling all the grades. I don't know if I, if I put the active, um, I did put an active filter on it. So it all, has all of the active grades. So it's an executives here. And then as the grade, and as you scroll down, the other grades will be here. Um, management. And let me see the one that I just created. Okay. So here's the one I just created. Uh, so I have the grade, I have the grade profile, and I have only added the peerage minimum, but we will edit this to add the midpoint and maximum as well. Um, the data source, and we'll get into what is the data source when we do the reporting. Um, but, you know, just to know to get the grade and grade profile data, um, you know, the more likely option is going to be the all composition grades would be your data source. And let me just pull in the midpoint. And then I do have the filter inactive being playing. So we only have the active grades. So, so this is basically the grade and the profiles report and it has data for all of the grades and the grid profiles that, that are in the system that are active and the pay ranges. So remember we create the grades and the uh, grid profiles to indicate what is the salary value of that particular position? Uh, because these grades are tied to, or they can be tied to a job profile. So an executive in China, their expected salary is, is gonna be between you know, this minimum and the maximum right here. Grades. Um, so this report composition grades used to see the EIB template. 
here is all of the composition data. I, I don't know the filters on this report because there's only, you know, only 33 grids are showing up. But um, this would have the information, everything that you need, it will give you a download, and then you put this into Excel and um, put it into your EIB template. Then they could modify it on the business side, give you the new min, you know, the modifications would be in the min and the midpoint and the maximum, or they might, you know, change the names. Obviously you can change the ID or you'll have to create new ones. Uh, so this report, um, um, is used to get the collective data, but since it's only returning 33, let me see what kind of filters we have on here. Once again, some of these um, grades, they do have eligibility rules on them, and they're helpful if you want to limit it to particular, um, you know, particular type of job. So here's a good one, like team level. Uh, management level seven to eight and not sales. And you could always test if someone is, is eligible for it. Um, where's that? Here's one, all employees. Uh, um, you wouldn't need a composition rule for that, but Let's see. 471. Okay. So make sure you practice creating a grid and grid profile. And uh, let me just go to a job profile now. Just one quick note on the job profile. I know we have seen this. Um, as you see here, the the name is the only the job profile name is the only thing that's required. But all of the rest of this information helps you organize and helps you default this information in in other places where you might need it. Um, I just want to show on this that the job code here it seems to be. Um, someone entered it, and I think I could modify it. Yeah, I can. Um, but some there there is a configuration that some with some companies that they don't want this to be editable, and they want this to be auto generated like as as a sequence. So uh, that is available as a configuration under the edit tenant XCM sequence generator. Um, I think in one of the previous sessions, we did go to where the uh, different sequence generators were. So if there is a need or a business ask you that, hey, they want to not allow any manual in input into that and then just sequence it, um, there is a way to do that under the sequence generators. So I'm make sure you guys were aware of that. Uh, for the sequence generator. So any tenant. ID definition for a job code. The for my notes, which I was going to upload. Um, The job requisitions, um, I know we did cover that. I just want to pull out some questions as, not questions, but just a review. Um, that, you know, job requisitions, the main thing I want to know for you guys to know is that um, it's not required, but um, if you're using workday recruitment, um, job requisition process is required. And there's actually three 
ways to set that up. Um, you could have create position, uh, you know, by itself as we saw. Uh, you could do a create job requisition by itself, or you could set it up in a way so that you create the job requisition, and then from that, a position gets created based on the data that you enter for the job requisition. So, you know, if you don't have separate, um, well, this allows you to have, you know, you go through one approval, uh, the recruiter creates the job requisition, and then the position also gets created automatically from it, and then they go through their, you know, whatever their approval process that has been set up. So I want to make sure that you guys are aware that um, you could create it by yourself, or create a job record by yourself, or you could create them uh, together. The second chat about the currency. Um, I don't know if I, that was probably from the older topic when we were talking about comp. Uh, Sneha, could you elaborate or we already covered it? So why are we spending, you know, time setting up these, uh, el you know, a compensation package and the eligibility rule? And within the eligibility rule, we, you know, we had eligibility rules for grades and grade profiles. Um, educational institutions may also have steps. So they may use grade profiles and steps, um, which are also like, you know, steps are based on years of experience or how the company wants to define it. So they're similar to grade profiles. And then we have the different plans. So the purpose of setting up all of these with eligibility rules is so that you minimize the data entry when you're hiring someone and you minimize the data entry when you're transferring someone. So if you have all of these set up, like the stock plan and the allowance plan like we saw yesterday, then when you're transferring someone into one role to another, um, these plans automatically show up for you to select. So they will either be there on the profile and then if you, you know, make, need to make any changes to the amounts, you could do it while you're doing the transfer. But at least the plan itself is there visible to the person who's doing the entry. Uh, so it makes the entry process a little bit smoother. And, you know, I just want to reiterate the definition of composition and eligibility rules. Let me put it on the screen. But the eligibility rules that we created, they're basically used to indicate which workers are eligible for which compensation component. So um, that's what we're gearing towards whenever we create an eligibility rule. It's basically trying to create a filter for the workers who are going to be eligible for it, for that particular grade or, or whoever's going to be, like the stock plan may not be for everybody. It's going to be for a certain group of employees and the composition eligibility rule helps you create that filter. And then, you know, some of the uh, job profiles, they did have grades tied to it and some of them didn't. Um, but, you know, probably best practice is to that when you create a grade, um, and it's meant for, you know, for a job profile, you tie it directly rather than putting some kind of eligibility rule on the grade profile. Um, on, the, on the job profile screen, we did see a field for grade and grade profile. So, you know, you could enter that on that screen. So yesterday, no one reminded me that when I was creating my uh, allowance plan or other plans, to add them to the compensation package. Remember I said, this is very important that whenever we create a compensation plan, it, not only that we need to create it and test it and roll it out, uh, but if we really wanna help with the data entry, it needs to be part of a compensation package. So today we will edit uh, our compensation package and we will add the plans that we created to uh, to the edit to the compensation package. Um, 
Um, so, you know, one of the tasks that everybody, all the companies are asking for is, hey, default uh, all the composition data. And so there's some rules that go along with it, which I'm showing on the screen is that uh, in order for composition packages, grades, and plans to default, uh, the following things must happen, right? The composition eligibility rules must be attached to all of the components, um, like at the composition package, there must be an eligibility rule. And uh, for the composition plans, they must have an eligibility rule. But for the composition grade, uh, you can have it, but it's optional. Uh, because once again, is, uh, the recommendation is that you actually tie the grade uh, to the job profile directly rather than relying on the eligibility rule. So that's what it's indicating here that instead of the, instead of the composition eligibility rule being attached to the composition grade, you can have the grade linked directly to the job profile. And the composition grade and the composition plans must be in the composition package for the defaulting to occur. So we'll look at a couple of packages and we'll see where that information is today. When certain dollars abbreviate, so here in this tenant, you know they have grouped uh, different types of employees under different uh, compensation packages. So there's an hourly, there's management, and then there's you know so on. So let's see how is the team member package identified. So I think this, the purpose of this one was to differentiate the team members from the, you know, from the management. So the individual contributor plan. So it requires a package name. Um, you know, it's helpful to have some kind of package description. And then it has an eligibility rule that says uh, team member management level seven to eight, but not sales. So just looking at that, it, it is it tries to be descriptive, but we really don't know what that means. So let's dig deeper and view the actual eligibility rule. So to, in this team member rule, it says, give me everybody who's in the management level um, seven through eight. So supervisors and in, individual contributors. So not just the, um, uh, individual contributors and salary uh, job profile is salaried and the organization and any superior organization is uh, not none in the selection list of sales so they said um, so everybody who falls you know who's eligible for this group and you can see who that is using the View eligible workers. So 274 people would would match the criteria that's defined in this rule. So there's an eligibility rule on the composition package, and the grade is here as well. And then the composition plans are listed here as well. Uh, composition basis is not required, but it would have been helpful for it to be here. And and there's the composition package analytics, means do we display the uh, base pay range? Uh, do we want to display the midpoint, you know, for the salary? And then um, should the guideline warnings be based on the total base pay? So when you're doing a job change or you're, you're doing hiring and you enter a salary amount that's higher than the range or less than the range, you get a little warning sign. So here it allows you to uh, have that warning based on the total base pay. Um, if you were, or you could do it on the primary compensation basis. So the base pay is just the actual hourly or your annual earnings but a composition basis it could be defined as 
um, your annual salary or your salary plus any additional income that you're earning maybe as part of an allowance plan. And then you have a choice to either hide the compensation ratio or leave it unchecked in, in the case it, you need to show it. If we were to create a new compensation plan, um, you know, for this, you know, um, for the same criteria, then we would edit this. But like once we have created the compensation plan, we actually need to come back to the compensation package and edit, give it an effective date. And the new plan that we created, uh, you can just add it here. Back to existing one. Uh, if it's not, like if we were, you know, yesterday we created an allowance plan, but we did not add it to any compensation package, but we were able to use it. We were able to roll it out to employees. Uh, but because it's not uh, tied to a particular package, um, the effect that it would have if it's not there is um, you will see it on the on the compensation screen, but it will be X'd out. So if you don't pay attention to it and you hit OK, um, the person's compensation, that particular plan would actually drop off. So it's very important to actually make sure any um, plans that you create and you add them to the composition package because it could screw up someone's data entry because it will show up, but it shows up in the, it's kind of grayed out and you know, you're likely not, you're not gonna see it. And if you don't select it, then it will you know, drop off from the person's profile. I was gonna say that while I'm adding here, I'm not gonna hit okay because uh, the eligibility rules for this one, you know, might be, you know, this, this one is prime may not be for this uh, package. So I'm just saying like, this is how you would add it, but you wanna make sure that you, in, you know, the, I'm just showing how to add one, not like, you know, this meets the, you know, the exact same requirements as this one. If I go to the composition tab, um, there's a total rewards page. This is a delivered uh, work day report. Uh, it's, you know, it's very helpful. It gives you the base pay in terms of salary. So this is a setup. Um, companies could choose to have it or not. Um, if they have their plans set up, like they have their allowance plans set up, incentive pay, benefits, it's all set up, and you want to show every, all of this data, uh, then it's very useful to have this uh, total rewards page. Uh, set up under profiles, so it would show up. If you don't have all of the information yet, uh, if all the plans are not set up, then um, then it doesn't make sense to have this tab. So most companies, they want to have this tab until everything is ready. Uh, and once everything is set up, then they'll display it. Otherwise, they'll just, the default page would be the compensation page. And here, we see at the top um, total sales and allowance and total base pay and then the total compensation as well so there is a definition of what these are and here the total pay and allowance is because even though she's in the u.s um, there's some salary, there's some salary elements in there that are addition to the base pay because her base pay is 215 and the total salary and allowance is 223. It's usually not a practice in the US to have allowances, but someone must have added some kind of compensation uh, element to her profile that the total base pay and the total salary plus allowance are different. So the, um, you know, if you're looking at the total base pay range, um, this is just the projected or advised. It's not, um, you know, the, you get a warning 
if you're, um, you, you know, there's a warning that if you're below that or you're above it, um, but it's only a warning. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't restrict you from having the actual salary or the actual cost to the company beyond that range. And remember on the compensation package under the, on the right hand side, it does say like, do you want the warning based on only if, you know, the total base pay? Like if their total base pay exceeds this range or you want the warning based on, um, uh, uh, based on the actual compensation basis that you might have set up, which would be different than the base pay. So let me actually share the definitions of compensation basis first. Okay, so you hear the term a lot, compensation basis. I think of it, you know, Worktree defines it as a, um, it's a group of compensation components that define the estimated earnings for the employee population. Okay. To me, it's just basically the, everything that goes into how we want to display the salary or how do you want to display, um, how do you want to calculate or the formula for behind, for behind showing what the, uh, the total salary is going to be for the person. So one component of the salary is your, you know, your annual salary or your hourly salary, but there's other components as well, right? There's uh, allowance plans, there's bonus plans. So if you want to include all of that as part of, you know, your total salary package. So in order to define that, uh, there's what's called the compensation basis. So all of the, everything that goes together in showing you what the earnings for the employee is. And then there's uh, three packages or three compensation bases that Workday delivers. And then you could make your own as well. So by default, we saw there is a total base pay, um, which includes all salary and allowance plans defined as base pay for your compensation grade or grade profile. Okay. And so that's your base pay. We have total salary and allowance. Um, include these plans assigned to a position. If you have um, some of these assigned on a position level versus the grade. And then what, what you have is eligible earnings override. Um, this means we don't care what the compensation, this is an override. So we're gonna override the data that's in Workday. So this comes in handy for the annual marriage or the annual bonus uh, plan, where um, when we say some, you know, this country, the projected bonus percentage is 3%. And so the next question is, okay, 3% of what? Uh, is it going to be 3% of the total base pay or is it going to be 3% of um, base pay plus, you know, some other factors or is it going to be 3% of base pay plus any overtime that the employees earned. So you'll notice that in Workday, there's no field for overtime um, by default unless you define it as some type of um, um, some type of element. So a lot of times, what the employee has actually earned is not just their salary, and that information may or may not be there in Workday. So what Workday allows you to do is um, use what's called the eligible earnings override. So for each employee. Uh, you may enter what their total earnings would be. So what they actually got, and you would get that number from payroll. Payroll will give you a list of, hey, this is what we actually paid this employee during this year. And they'll give you that number and you would manually enter it or you could upload it as a load. And um, for bonus processing purposes, you could use that number. You could use, you will use the eligible earnings uh, instead of the projected salary that's in workday. 
in cases where that amount would, would be different. And, and the place where I have used it as a real life example would be, um, we have some folks who are uh, non-exempt and um, they're on hourly. And because they're hourly, they earn, but there's very few of them. There's only like five or six in the company. They're earning, uh, they do earn a um, overtime. But because there are so few in number, there's no special plan set up for them. But we want to make sure that when we calculate the bonus, you know, the law requires that the bonus be paid on their total earnings. Uh, but because we didn't have their overtime and workday, we couldn't use the, you know, their salary amount from workday. So we actually had to upload what they earned during the year as a file using the eligible earnings overwrite. Um, for the bonus processing purposes. So I know this is kind of like um, a new concept, you know, just that word compensation basis, but when you see it enough, you'll get to know what that is. Okay, so we're talking about compensation basis. So it, it basically is the collection of all the elements that go into what the total earnings are for the, um, you know, for your workers or, or your employees. So it includes such, obviously, as the salary, um, which is going to be either a annual or hourly. So that's going to be one part of your compensation basis. And it can have allowance or commission bonus or stock as well. And Workday allows you to define uh, your compensation basis as well. Typically, um, the reason you may need two different compensation bases is that in the U.S., when you're listing like the total base pay or when you're paying a bonus, um, it does it, it does not include any allowance or any commissions. It's just based on the base pay of the employee. Um, but I know, especially in India, and I think it's true for other um, countries as well, you have to pay the bonus based on the total cost to the company. And also you organize the earnings um, based on you know, the concept of what is the total cost to, to the company. So in that case, it's gonna be their you know, salary, it's going to be their allowance plan, it's going to be um, benefit. So, um, so there's the cost of total cost to the company. And if you want to show that um, number in Workday, then you, create, you need to create a, um, your own composition basis, which will have all of these elements in there. So then it would show up on your composition screen. Um, it is an advanced topic. Um, but you do see it on the work to screens, you know, compensation basis. And it just, you know, basically it's just a, how are you defining your earnings that you see? Is it just the base pay or does it have um, allowance as well or any of these other elements? If you want to define your total compensation, for a, a set of employees. So example would be sales employees, their total compensation is, you know, about, you know, half of their compensation comes from their annual salary, but a good chunk of their compensation comes from commissions. And you want to be able to, um, you don't want to, when you're doing the data entry, you don't want to have to think of, okay, here, this person was, um, you know, their total compensation was 175K. And you want to enter half of that as their annual base and half of that in their commissions. So you could set up a compensation basis in a way so that it would divide their total salary um, based on that ratio of base pay and the commissions portion. Um, that's a little bit of an advanced topic. We're not going to cover that, but um, but I did want to expose you to what is a compensation basis and you know some some of the use case for it. 
Um, and then now let's go back to our compensation screen and then um, do some compensation transactions. Um, so there is a request compensation change. We'll look into that. Uh, proposed compensation higher. That was, you know, when you're in the higher process, when we entered the uh, salary, that was a business process for proposed compensation. And I'm going to skip over the proposed compensation offer. Um, that's during recruiting. But basically, the screen that where you enter the compensation uh, during when you create the offer. So there is a you know, there's a business process for that as well. And then there is the proposed compensation um, uh, process when we're making any changes. Um, so let's look at uh, request compensation change business process from the front end. And we go to actions and then compensation and Sorry, where's the, uh, let me, obviously let me pull a different employee because you're not gonna do compensation on yourself. Um, okay, so under compensation, request compensation is one place. And then there's also a uh, job change. And then as part of job change, there's gonna be a uh, compensation you know, change as well. So let me do the compensation request by itself first. Uh, the effective date, by default, it says you know, use the next pay period so that the compensation change is done in a clean manner. And payroll processing is, you know, they don't have to, you know, try to figure out, okay, you started the new salary in, in the middle of the period. So compensation changes, you know, typically best practice is that they start at the beginning of the period. And it's better to have it start at the next uh, period. But it doesn't have to be because in HR, a lot of times things are backdated. So like, you know, they're supposed to get this salary since uh, beginning of June. So you could definitely do that if there's no other conflicting transactions that are already in the system for this employee. So here we have to select the composition change reason. So it could be an adjustment. It could be some type of um, incentive. So I'm, just, I'm going to say market adjustment. Okay. And we see the primary compensation basis for this employee. And here we actually change the salary amount. I could give it as a change as a amount change or as a percentage. So it's simpler to do a percentage. So let's, say, let's just do a 5%. Or actually, let me make it more than 400K so we can see that warning that shows up. We also see that this um, allowance plan, plan showed up by default and it was here. And even if I did not select it, you know, the plan will not fall off. But if this plan was not part of the composition package, it won't, it will show up over here, but it would be actually in a, you could see the plan, but it will be in kind of deleted state. And then if I, if I were to, um, click submit without clicking over here and hitting the checkbox. If it was not part of the compensation package, this plan would get dropped off. 
and then the person would lose this uh, allowance and it won't be calculated as part of their salary. Any other plans that they're eligible for, they show up by default, but we're not making any changes to them. Um, at the time of annual marriage process or bonus process, we could add the plans. Like, you know, in the marriage plan, you may have it as part of the profile from the time that you hire them. But typically, you don't do that. You only assign the plan at the time when you're going to do the marriage process. So you assign the plan and um, you could also remove the plan. So, you know, you obviously you will do the mass assigning of the plans, but then there will be a couple of employees where the mass assignment does not work because they might be on leave or some other kind of issue. So in that case, you need to assign the plan to them manually through request comp change. This would be one way to do that. It's not the only way, but it's one way to assign the plans to them through this. Um, you could add a stock plan and hit submit. So I'm getting this warning that total base pay is above pay range maximum. But I could still hit submit. So here, there was the request. So as Logan, I entered it. And since I was entering it as Logan, there's probably some kind of rule in there that manager approval is not required, but it did go to controller. So I wanna see what that business process is like and what are the uh, steps in that approval process. So here's the business process, or this is a workflow that goes behind it. And uh, if you just look on the very right hand side, these are the groups or user groups that act on it or they get some kind of action. So while you know the initiator is listed here like these are the groups that could initiate it like composition partner or hr partner or manager um, they initiate this but then it goes to um, if it met this rule like assigning is not the same as the previous step assigning um, because i logan is a compensation partner herself um, that's why we did not see it going to Composition partner, if you know, if, if uh, Joy Banks had entered the salary change, and she is not the compensation partner, and then whoever is the compensation partner, it would go to them, and then after that, it would go to the manager, and then uh, based on whatever this condition is, it would go to the manager's manager, and then if the change is greater than twenty percent, it goes to the controller. So that's why we saw it go to the controller. And then the employee, um, they get some documents that probably show them what that change is. So pretty straightforward, but very uh, considerable process. And we'll, you know, we'll create our own, we'll, we'll modify it when we do the uh, business process uh, lecture. But um, the only tricky part over here is the conditions that you make. Uh, some of them are pretty simple to make, such as base pay change percent greater than 20%. Uh, so this is also similar to, you know, uh, uh, the kind of like eligibility rules that we created. So I wanna see this rule. Let me open that up in a new tab. So basically it just says um, base pay change percentage is greater than or equal to 0.2. So it's uh, 20%. 
And so now the, you know, the change is sitting with the controller. And if I were to proxy in as controller and then approve it, then the change would be uh, made for that person effective 6-1. And where do we actually see this data? Um, if I go to Joey Banks, this will be in her profile, but it will still say um, it's not completed yet. So I would go to the job and we go to history, job history. Every, I think there's some kind of uh, security issue or it's not set up in a way so that I have um, the compensation history. Um, let me find it, it should be here. So every, you know, tenant, you could decide what these tabs you want to show. Um, under job history, you should see, you know, different categories. Um, that's kind of strange. It's, I don't see a compensation history there. But no matter, I could go to it from another path uh, under actions and then worker history, view worker history or view worker history by category. So there's always multiple ways to do something um, and multiple ways to navigate. Okay, so I went to view worker history by category. And then here I see anything related to staffing, but I'm gonna to skip to compensation because that's the transaction that I just did. And I do see that effective 6-1, uh, there was an ad hoc composition change and the status is in progress. And it has the, the current and the proposed amount. And it's easier to see it if I put it in full screen mode. Um, so it's got the current and proposed. And now let me do a transaction based on um, job change. So here we just did a compensation, but we didn't do any job profile or you know anything anything else. So this is a quick way for the HR partner or the manager to submit just a compensation change. But if there was other changes as well, then you would do a job change. So we do a transfer, promote, or job change. But let me not do it on Joy Banks because she's used in a lot of uh, test cases. Let me pick another employee. I'm trying to find a support that has like workers listed. Okay, so let's change Johnson's um, pay. But we're gonna do it through a common uh, job change, transfer from world or change job functionality. So here, once again, you have to add a effective date and then you have to add a reason. And remember yesterday I showed you guys where to update these recent codes from. Um, from under the maintain category and recents, I believe, you know, uh, check out yesterday's video for the navigation for it. Um, let's get this person a promotion. Um, the manager is not gonna change, so we're gonna leave Joy Banks alone. Uh, the supervisory org or the team will stay the same and nothing else changes.
So here it's asking me, um, do I want to create a new position or there might already be an existing one that's open. So I'm going to see if, what, if there's any position that's already open. Nope. Nope. Um, then obviously before I can promote someone, I need to have a, a position that's available. So, and I say, go ahead and create a new position. And do I want to close the current one? So I'll leave that one open because just because she's getting promoted, um, it doesn't mean that we no longer have a need for the admin assistant position because now someone else will fill that. So we're not gonna hit close the current position. We'll leave that one alone. And is the position available for overlap? That means, you know, like she might be trans, she might be getting promoted next month, but can we use that position that she's currently in to hire someone else um, for the time being rather than having to create a different position? So that position overlap allows you to do that, allows you to have more than one person temporarily sitting in the same seat. So she's getting promoted to a business analyst role. So it shows that the executive um, job profile has been removed and the business analyst has been added. If there was a location change, we would enter that here. Um, details would be just details of that job profile. So it's a salary job and there's a job, you know, it's in the job classifications and it has a particular workers comp code. Um, and then even though it says here like first day of work, this really means first day of work in that particular job profile. So this says, you know, June 22, you know, that was my effective date. So first day of work in this uh, job profile, not that, you know, her hire date. I think that could have been worded a little bit better, but yeah, it does look confusing to see first year of work uh, listed as that. Um, if there is some type of uh, attachment that goes along with it, maybe is uh, uh, some type of email that you wanna attach or um, some, some companies use a compensation change letter that needs to go along that as part of their profile. You could attach it here. You can also attach it at the at the end of the process. If they're going to a different organization or a different cost center, you could change it on this same screen as well. And then compensation change would be here. So I see that the merit plan is being removed um, and it says the plan is inactive. So I think that's why it's getting removed. And a new one is being added. So it's probably is because as when she was an admin assistant, uh, she was eligible for the merit human resources plan. And now that she's in a different job profile, uh, the merit salary plan shows up. So it allows you to see what's being removed. And at the new one, there might be an instance where, you know what, she's still gonna be, she's still gonna stay on the same plan. So I could undo this by clicking on the arrow. I could restore it um, or I could let it be deleted. And then this is the, based on the plan um, eligibility rules, the merit salary plan, uh, showed up by default, right? I did not have to think about what she's going to be um, eligible for because everything was set up properly. This plan showed up and it will just default in. And same thing with uh, the bonus plan. The old bonus plan is being removed and the new bonus plan, uh, because her job profile changed, is being added automatically. 
And similarly with the stock, if she was a sales employee, you could also add commission plans if there was one set up. Okay, and then the summary page, and then I'm gonna go ahead and submit it. So in this case, it went to the next level manager. Okay, so those are two main ways to uh, initiate a comp change. We, we initiated the comp change from the employee's profile. We went to actions, and then we went to request comp, and we went to you know change job. Um, you could also type directly in the search bar request comp change and then you can start your task from here and you select the employee so multiple ways to do something so the job change by itself um like for example you might say hey you want to get rid of the location change and um, those sub processes so if there is a sub process in there that's been added uh, you can modify that but there is a delivered part to it that you cannot so i have to find the job change um, process to see what it looks like which um, but you could definitely add things to it like we did not see a step um, for, um, you know, if, if the person was going to a new manager and that person was not a manager before, so that you could have a step in there itself. So let me see, JG. but it really depends how it is set up. But there's certain sections which are delivered, you, you cannot remove. Like if you wish that you could remove the um, uh, location uh, from it, let me, let me try to find that. Um, let me try to edit this. I know the cost center page we could remove and some pages you cannot. I won't actually click OK because we shouldn't modify you know, the, the processes unless you create your own. But I just want to see if it's um, editable to remove. So the assigned pay group. Um, here is part of the process, right? If there was a, there's something called changing the pay group, right? Which payroll uses. And that's a step that goes to payroll. So you could choose to have it as part of a job change process, or you could keep that as a standalone. So that is, I know pay group is not a standard part of the job change. So you could definitely add or remove. So you could remove it from here. Uh, but it's probably smart to keep it so that in case there is a pay group change. But because it doesn't happen often, um, it's usually not part of the job change. You know, it's only a, it's part of the hire process because you set it up at the time of hire. But the only other time it's going to change is when you do a location transfer or you go from an exempt to non exempt or vice versa. So things that don't happen a lot, uh, they don't have to be part of the job change process. So even the, um, you know, there's a sub process, change organization assignments. This is where we saw the uh, cost center uh, change. So see this, since this is a standalone process by itself, uh, we could remove it from here. Um, but anything that's part of the job change process, then that you cannot. But the only reason that I know that you know we could change this is because I just happen to know that change org is a process by itself and it's being added here because it is a common thing that when we're doing a job change, the cost center may change as well. So it makes sense to have 
change job as part of the job change process. Um, so that just comes from experience or you know you look up what, what are the existing processes available. So just like I, I looked up job change, you can see that um, if I type VP change org assignments, that's a separate process. So there's change org assignments as a separate process. So you could modify it if you are using any sub processes, you could take them out and you could add some sub processes in. You, um, there's a restriction of which sub processes you could add. Like you cannot just pick any process and add it to another one. Um, but the things that are within that same function or domain, you could add. Okay, I want to go back to the employee profile and I'm going to go to Logan's profile and I'm going to show you um, some more comp data. So I'm still curious why is this number says 223 and this one says 215 um, because in the US typically um, these two numbers would be the same. So if I need to investigate that, um, one place for me to investigate where we're getting this number is go under actions and go under composition. So composition, um, here I can see view, composition review statements and view total rewards. I wanna see the composition basis as well. Uh, let me pick a different employee because since I'm logged in as Joy as Logan. Um, so if I go under view composition basis details, it will tell me how the composition is being calculated. So we have to pick an effective date. So we want to see the composition basis as of today, or I could pick a um, different date in the past or future. So here we have different sections. Um, it has the employee's position and their job profile. And you know it's important to recognize that this person's on a, um, you know, Full-time equivalence is 100%, and they're working 40 hours out of the 40 scheduled hours for that location. So their total base pay is uh, 327 in this case. So this is not Logan's data, but it does show us how the data, you know, was being part of their uh, salary package or their base pay. So under the composition basis of total base pay, uh, remember this is what's delivered by Workday and it only has the salary. So the total base pay composition basis only has salary and the salary is 327. And another composition basis that work it delivers is the total salary and allowances. So in this case, um, this person actually has an allowance of 1800 plus an executive housing allowance of 60K a car allowance and then their salary. So this is why the numbers that we saw in those two widgets, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be the same for Logan as well, is um, we saw in one of, you know, the one that said uh, story salary and allowance, it had the allowance data plus salary, and the other one only had the salary by itself. I was just surprised that in the US, um, um, we don't do allowances for execs, at least I, I have not seen that. I mean, maybe some companies do do that, um, but I was just kind of surprised to see those amounts being uh, different. Okay. And then we have um, total compensation. 
and the formula like what's you know what is part of the total compensation so these are the elements that went into it so it was the allowance plus bonus plus salary so under the total comp uh, widget we saw a different amount which is made up of um, bonus as well and so there was those three circles um, total base pay total salary plus allowance and total compensation and and this is what's the difference between each one of them and this is how the um, you know that formula for displaying you know total comp is so this this page is really helpful to know what is really part of that compensation that you see and if it doesn't match what the expectations are like if you expected the total total salary and allowance to be a different number and you know it's not coming out correct uh, it is off by six thousand so you come over here and see that hey, you expected this person to be on an allowance car but it doesn't show you uh, that this person is on that so this helps in troubleshooting why the salary that you see doesn't match the expectations so i find this page extremely helpful to understand how that conversation is being calculated you know to show to the employee you could definitely add it to the total rewards that hey this is your salary and you know here's your um, benefits and the cost of the employer so here's the data point that you're referring to so we could definitely show it on the total rewards page okay. um, but it's not part of something that's actively managed by payroll to pay them right so i think um, you could definitely create a composition basis that includes your benefit cost um, but if you want to just show it to the employee you could show it on you know it's on this page as long as you set up this page yet okay so uh, when you have issues in compensation, um, it's typically related to something like, you know, I have a real life issue where our compensation for India employees was not showing up correctly on those top uh, compensation buttons. And it, it was because the, um, the plans that were set up were not part of the package. So troubleshooting tips is always check that the plans that you have set up they're part of the compensation package the compensation basis that you're using is part of the compensation as well and uh, make sure the package defaults are what you expect so check those three things and in addition so on the compensation comp package you check those things make sure you check the eligibility criteria you check all the elements that are part of the compensation package to see if they're correct and then as far as the compensation plan itself check the plan eligibility make sure that everybody that you expect is being filtered based on that eligibility check the plan profiles because remember at the profile level is where we indicate like the default uh, we do indicate you know there's a default amount for the plan at you know when we're setting it up but even in the plan profile you know we said hey if this person is in india then give them 10 percent or you know 5,000. Uh, so check the plan profiles check the plan basis and if you have multiple compensation plans you could only have one override plan uh, on you know when we're setting up the compensation plan um, we had an option to select hey you could override this and in order for everything to default correctly you could only have one override plan and then you also want to check the plan default assignments section of on the compensation screen of that person there's a you know where all the plan defaults are listed uh, you want to check that section 
in the plan default assignments, which was uh, regular compensation. Uh, yeah, the planned assignments to make sure everything is correct over here. Um, and then the you know, compensation change history by itself is listed there. Um, these are optional profiles. A lot of companies have them. A lot of companies don't. Depending on how sophisticated they have stuff set up. Okay, so that basically concludes our compensation part. Um, of this class.